Yep, I do. Okay, great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Devanshi Parohit. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Committee on Resilient Environments um, with uh, Dave Hampton, who is also a co-chair here. Um, and uh, we try to focus on sort of uh, resiliency conversations that are focused on uh, people, community, governance, and ecology. And uh, I think what a fitting panel uh, we have today. Uh, we have Celine Armstrong uh, from New York, um, who is joining us. She's going to talk about um, Little Island. It's a new park that has just opened um, in New York City. And then we have Amy Whiteside um, from Boston. Um, from, um, she's the director of uh, resilience and research at Stoss, and she's been um, working in the, on the vision plan for Moakley Park. Um, so we're going to have a conversation about the future of uh, designing the future of uh, waterfront parks um, for the next century, um, as well as some of the issues that the current uh, park design faces and how, um, what are the best practices to address it. So we'll have uh, two presentations. We'll have some Q&A in between, and then we'll have a larger discussion at the end of it. And I'll start with Celine. Welcome. Um, and a little bit of, about Celine. Um, she's a leader in the public realm uh, who just completed this um, island park in the west side of New York. Um, she was the first employee um, uh, for, the, for the Little Island, which is a $250 million project uh, funded by um, Diller, I'm going to not pronounce it right, but Diller von Furstenberg Family Foundation. Um, and it's one of the biggest uh, public-private par partnerships in New York uh, and the second largest in US. Um, and Celine oversaw the design and construction of the pier, uh, ensuring the vision um, became reality for all New Yorkers. Um, she's also an avid commuter cyclist and loves the city streets and also chairs the AIA New York Future Streets Committee that uh, is responsible for transforming streets into pedestrian-oriented uh, spaces. She holds a Master of Science in Architecture and Urban Design from Columbia and was also my uh, classmate and we graduated together at Columbia. <laughs> um, so Celine, if you want to just share your screen and uh, present um, and then we'll, uh, we'll start with some of the Q&A. Great, thank you. And one thing that we learned while we were in school is because it was in New York City, um, it was about the history of our waterfront and how you know, back in the day, the, the water was used for shipping. And then, and that's why Central Park was so important because the city was more focused as far as the people space was on the inside of the city. And then as shipping moved away from, um, fr well, from ships and moved more to trucks, all of a sudden people started looking to the waterfront and really wanted to reclaim it. And so this park is just one part of the Hudson River Park. Uh, it's a four mile stretch along the west side of Manhattan. I'll show a map soon, but that's the idea of how do you take these derelict parks and then turn it into space for people. So let's go down that path of how it was created. And I, I'd be curious for those, whether you visited or haven't visited yet, please come join us. It's pretty incredible that this is a rendering that looks very similar to that in real life. And, oh, it's not advancing. There we go. So as I mentioned, Little Island, which was essentially Pier 55, is one small postage stamp of a park within a larger park system. But it's really incredible and important because we push the boundaries on design and this thinking about what does this park mean for the future? How do we create spaces that are different than long linear piers? And this is an image of that long linear pier, Pier 54, which essentially was dilapidated and over time, it just kept getting smaller and smaller for the amount of space people could use. And when I um, moved to New York, it was essentially used for people to try to learn how to ride their bikes. And this is what it changed into over time. Um, but back when it could be used for public open space, it was used for river rocks and blues barbecue. So big events, 
Um, people in the neighborhood knew this park as like kind of the event park, but again, it's long and, and narrow. So it doesn't really make great space for people gathering. Um, within the Hudson River Park Act, so that's like the rule book for what you can do along the west side in Manhattan. So Manhattan's waterfront, there are different jurisdictions around it. This happens to be state property, and there was essentially a um, an act that was created that allowed, you know, passive and active open spaces, allowed for recreation, and essentially sent the framework for what the shape of this park could be as far as the square footage of coverage, as well as the activity use of this park. It is a, a public um, park. It's not a commercial park, which there are some in the Hudson River, but this one's a public park, which I think is important to keep in mind. And the Hudson River Park had reached out to the Diller von Furstenberg Family Foundation to help fund it. And so I'll just, you guys can all read, but it's the idea where they were they found a partner that really believed in making the community better. And again, as I mentioned previously, is a long linear pier. It's great for ships, not so good for people gathering. And then it was moved. It was kind of shifted in between Pier 54, which is at Pile Field down to the bottom of your screen, and then Pier 56. But also moving it gave room for the Gansevoort Pier, which is just to the south. Right now it's under construction. Devonchi, next time you're here, you'll see that it's gonna be this amazing, a really big soccer field, but also um, a lot of ecological components mixed in with a beach on the south side and some uh, wetlands on the north side. And so the fact that this park shifted a little bit, gave it its own space. And then also Pier 57, which, we call the Google Pier, um, it's the largest tenant. There's also a public park on its roof. And so this allowed for each space to have its own breathing room. And from what you'll see here as well, um, that these corners are picked up and that allows for light to get in underneath for the fish. So it allows, um, you know, different ecology up above. We think this has four very distinct microclimates but also it changes what's below, where before you had a, a, a pier that was at elevation six, which you know during Sandy would have flooded. Um, and now it's elevated at elevation 15, and then it allows for different sun and air patterns around the space. So the reason it is an island is to allow a gradual climb um, across the ramps to get to the park. And if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to ask. This is a view of the park today. So this is a rendering. It looks very similar to the renderings. I was just shocked at how, um, you know, how realistic the renderings were, but how careful the team was with their vision that they would actually be able to, we would be able to build the vision. Uh, I think Devanchi mentioned my role. I was not, well, I am a a traditionally trained designer, I took a role on the client team to manage design and construction. And I'm just always enamored with how talented our team was. And it was such a joy to build this with them. If you strip off that lawn, what you'll see is the deck underneath, uh, which supports the amphitheater space. Those are, there are restrooms below. Devanji, I don't know how much exploring you did while you were here, but it's actually a large green roof and the restrooms are still at elevation 15, but as you explore the pathways, uh, you, write, you rise to elevation 62 in the Southwest corner. One thing that's so unique about this structure is the concrete pots and pile system. They were fabricated north of Albany, um, each petal individually, and then just trucked to the, to the Hudson River essentially where Coimans was able to put them together and pick them up with a gantry and place it on a barge and it floated down the Hudson River. So our piles floated up from Virginia and these structures floated down from um, upstate New York. And we were challenged by, you know, do we really wanna build this out of concrete? I'm sensitive to the carbon footprint of concrete, but in order to create a structure that didn't require a lot of shade or a lot of rectilinear components um, and that could tolerate salt water. This seemed like the best material for the site. And 
it has been incredible and it was fun to work with the team and just think about the economic stimulus of being able to build this on the eastern seaboard and then to use the water um, i feel like it's just now becoming back in fashion to try to figure out how to transport goods on the waterfront and these gentlemen were able to figure it out for us uh, we essentially built everything on the water we didn't have any lots to to build from it was all through the water so we had barge mounted cranes and because of schedule we built the project from the east moving west and we're able to insert lessons learned from building it on the east side to then making a few changes to the west side and as you can see here this is an actual photo of the construction the pile field to the bottom left of your screen that is the old pile field 56 which we it, you know leaving that there was very difficult because we couldn't get crane access these items all the elements are very heavy and so we had to get larger cranes in order to avoid hitting those pile fields, which are important for the marine ecology. You know, different critters grow on them, other critters eat them. And as the water is getting cleaner, we're finding that more, um, you know, the environment down below is getting stronger. And that's really exciting to see the Hudson River change over time. So from the, you know, transport environment to now really respecting the waterfront and getting more and more visitors to the waterfront to understand why it's important to appreciate it. This is an image of the landscape. Um, the trees were all found within 200 miles of the project. The soil was created from, you know, organic material um, decomposing with sand. So it wasn't stripped from any land. It, you know, as much as we could, we used local materials and sourced them as close to the project as possible. And here it is today. So the, you know, people didn't believe us when, I, when we said this is an important pollinator project and my goodness, the bees and the birds um, really have taken over this project. So it's as though you're trans, transported to another world just so close to Manhattan, but completely enveloped in this landscape more images of the greenery. And then you see the amphitheater. So as we saw early on from the Hudson River Park, it was important to them to maintain a space for programming for either theater or larger gatherings. And because of COVID, there haven't been a lot of large gatherings, but the amphitheater has been used quite a bit, which has been so delightful. The planting plan is incredible. This is designed by Signe Nielsen and you know, every season we have different blooms. Um, every week there's a walk to see like what is doing well, what is not doing well. What you read in your textbook that would grow in a saltwater environment actually doesn't always grow along the Hudson River. We are able to tap into our resources at the Hudson River Park to see what works in this environment and to design directly toward that. This is just a fun image of construction of the amphitheater portion, which does dip down a little bit. You'll notice that a lot of these materials is basically concrete, which means it can be flooded if needed, but this elevation is still three feet higher than the elevation along Manhattan's um, west side. So the park was elevated quite a bit. The materials used for this, these benches were, is this black locust, so it's a, a local tree. Most of the wood came from Pennsylvania. And then you get beautiful sunsets. So to bring more people this close to the water and engage in art and the environment was really important. So there's an entire educational component that goes with it that the staff here at the office um, work on with students and adults alike. So it's been such a joy. And Devanchi, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Lee. So I have two questions and maybe we'll take one more question uh, from the audience. But one question that Sherry asked is, is the direct water access provided at any area of this park? Why were the pilings for the just in piers kept? I think you answered the second question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see the chat. So direct water access. So at the time when we built this project or we're getting approvals, you were not allowed to have touchdowns in the park or to the water where on Brooklyn Bridge Park was a bit of a different timeline and different jurisdiction, but at Little Island as part of Hudson River Park, which is state property, we weren't allowed to do that. But now 
Governor um, Gansevoort, which is the park just south of Little Island, you can get right down into the water, which is, you know, it was one of those things where I'm like, guys, why are we not doing this? And it, you know, they were still of the mindset of hard edges are better. And even though we knew differently, it's, we couldn't get it permitted. And what were, if I were to ask you, what were the three biggest challenges on making Little Island happen? What were the key challenges? Yeah. Well, one, we didn't know if we could build it. So we had to spend time with fabricators to understand how our computer models could then speak to their computer models because they weren't actually able to fabricate the pot by traditional methods. Uh, typically you drive a pile, you then survey it, you build a pile cap, which is larger than what you need for the pile in case there's some movement or you don't get it exactly spot on. And then you put some planks in and pour concrete, right? Just very rectilinear, kind of like you're using Legos to build. And for this project, one, we had to figure out how to build the pot structure, which was you know, quite remarkable to see everyone just leave their ego at the door and link arms with the contractor to figure out how do we actually do this and everyone talking to each other. And then once we figured out the pot, because they did take so much longer to fabricate and we could only drive piles during the summer because of the fish habitat, we had to fabricate year round for the pots while we were pile driving, which meant those piles had to be spot on. We couldn't, we didn't have the luxury of time to drive piles and then fabricate. We had to be doing it at the same time. So it was just a lot of holding our breath and making sure that the equipment knew exactly um, where that pile needed to go. And thankfully we didn't hit things in the river, maybe a boulder here and there, but we were, I was terrified of what's in this river. Like back in the day, people just, when they didn't want something, they just threw in the river. Like what were we going to find? And thankfully we didn't find anything in this area. And so we got lucky in that part, but we had to take risks of moving forward with the construction while we were still working on the design and figuring out how things would work. And and what how did how did the process look like between you and you know the the designer and the um, the landscape uh, architect and also how did the process look like between you and the larger community process and getting getting this park permitted. Sure. So we'll start with the community aspect of it, because that really came first. While there was a, a design concept that the Hudson River Park Trust and Barry Diller entered into because he wanted it to be a design competition to have people with innovative ideas come up with um, different thought provoking uh, designs. Um, we took a concept to the community and we followed the state process for community engagement. And honestly, the Hudson River Park really led that effort. I would go with Sydney Nielsen, who's the landscape architect, and present what the, the thoughts were. And as we made design changes, so we went from gabion walls to sheet pile walls to allow more soil on the park to then have more robust landscape, we would provide those updates. Um, but there is a very clear process for how you work with the community and what the what the components are based on the master plan that we were essentially confined to work within. Um, as far as my engagement with the designers, we had weekly design meetings. They were the designer, but I had to, you know, not necessarily play traffic police, um, but very much ensure that what they were working on. It, still follow the vision that the client signed up for, as well as engaged with the contractors on a regular basis during pre-construction. I highly recommend if your project can afford it, which I don't think any project can't afford it because it saves you money, is to work with contractors to just kind of gut check your project for buildability sake and, and timeline. So we had weekly meetings just one-on-one -on -one, and then we had monthly meetings with the client team and all the designers. So the big, the core design team was Heather Wick Studio, Era, Musa Rutledge, Matthews Nielsen, and Fisher Morantz did our lighting and Standard Architects was our local architect. So we had quite a large team, about 30 people every month getting together to look at material samples, look at the design and make sure that we were still following the same course that one, we promised to the community and two, we believe we could build. 
Um, I think Sherry has another question. Can you tell what was the breakdown of the cost between total cost for the project that is the structural landscape design and engineering and how was it financed? Mm, so I don't have the cost details right next to me, but essentially it's a $250 million project. The structure alone was just over $100 million. And for design and engineering, I can't remember what that number was, um, but it was financed by Barry Diller put up most of the money. There was $20 million from city state funding. So that paid for um, half of the design process. So they put in $7 million and then we hired half of the designers and we we're going side by side until the project really became something that was going to be built. And then Little Island took over the rest of that design um, fee, but it's essentially, it's a, it's a complete public private partnership. So we were paying half, they were paying half until they reached their cap because they only had so much money they could provide. And then they supplied the rest of the funds toward um, like finishes. So the handrails, and I think some of the landscape, they hired those trades to just make sure that the public entity component was still a very engaged and um, um, like partner toward the end of the project. So it wasn't, oh, thank you, now we'll finish it. It was very much public-private all the way along. But at the end of the day, the project did grow. It grew significantly and Barry Diller's Family Foundation said, you know, we want to do something innovative, so let's build it. I think there is a follow-up question on the community and the design decision. I'll combine the two questions. It's basically, what did the design decision process look like and how was the, was there any community component in actually deciding to go with this design? Mm -hmm. So when I started on the project, we were pretty much finished with concept. So I'm not in sure, I'm not fully certain how that process went, but I know there was a design competition for the, to decide on Heatherwick. But I I do know that the day that the design competition, they, they presented the information or that it was selected, Sandy hit. So all none of the designs that were presented could be used because then we had to raise the elevation for a future flood. Um, concerns. And so even though there, there was a design competition, people came with designs, you know, a few weeks later, that was all thrown out because the elevation had to change. And you can't really, you don't want to put stairs or an elevator right next to the waterfront. So it was, it, that's how it turned into an island. Um, and then Zachary has a few questions on uh, who oversees the public-private uh, relationship and who was eligible for the competition. Hmm. So who oversees the public-private relationship? That's a good question. I would ask the public side of it. So the Hudson River Park Trust, they are the landlord, we are the tenant. So we had to follow their rules and they are um, responsible to the governor. And while I was hired to be this like nexus between the public and private component of it. So I had an office and worked two days a week down at the public agency and then worked a few days a week at the nonprofit sector. Um, I would just say that the Hudson River Park oversaw the public private relationship. They were the public agency who were the landlords. We were just a tenant. It's just that because of the, the donation amount, um, yeah. It just like he had naming rights, but chose not. Mr. Diller had naming rights, but chose to name it Little Island because he was like, we're giving this money because we believe that it's important for the city to have really remarkable public open space. And the Hudson River Park Trust just made sure all the rules were followed and that they participated and had full rights toward design and material selection, very involved in um, the community aspect when it comes to what can be programmed, when can it be programmed, what trees are selected, what is your salt uh, allowed so you're not allowed to do, um, add any chemicals or anything for snow removal. And so they set all of those parameters. And then there's one for who's eligible for the competition. I actually don't know that question because that was before my time. 
So um, Celine is uh, going to stay for a, uh, you know, a few more minutes and then she can probably answer some of the questions that are upcoming in the chat. Uh, Celine, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can move on to our next uh, presentation by Amy. So Amy is the Director of Resilience and Research at STOS, um, where she brings a background in landscape architecture, science communication, um, ecology, and biology to projects of wide ranging scales. Um, she also leads the water planning, waterfront planning efforts focused on resiliency, uh, resilient public spaces, including climate ready East Boston, Charlestown, downtown, the North End, um, and the Coastal Resilience Plan for Nantucket. Um, as well as some site-based design projects, including the vision plan for Mokley. And uh, we worked together on Suffolk Downs Redevelopment Project. Um, uh, the, that was a four-year process. Um, she's currently leading Boston's Urban Forest Plan, which is a citywide effort aimed at creating an equity-centered plan for the development and management of Boston trees. Maybe that's a new um, talk that we schedule in the future and talk more about trees. Um, and she's also a design critic at GSD. She's gonna talk about Mokley Park, which is still uh, at a vision and a design and a planning stage, but that there are a lot of synergies that I can see between the two parks. So Amy, if you wanna share your screen. Yeah, great. Thanks, Devonshi. Um, let's see. Okay. Can you see that? Perfect. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks Devonchi. Thanks for having us. Um, and, and thanks, Selena. It was really fun to see the, the little island work. I was just recently there. So it's cool to hear a little bit about how it how it happened. Um, so as Devonchi mentioned, uh, you know, I'm the director of resilience at Stoss. We are a, a um, relatively small office. We're about 20 people, um, but we're based in two locations with our, our primary office being in Boston and our uh, kind of secondary small office in Los Angeles. So, um, you know, kind of work work on these issues across the country. And we, as Devonchi kind of hinted at, we work across scales. So, you know, whether that's the scale of the city or the site, um, but sort of regardless of how we are working on resilience, it's always about both the ecological and the social, um, and really about how, um, you know, the development of public realm that is accessible, inclusive, and offers really healthy opportunities for recreation, as well as protection from, from risk, and in particular, protecting kind of our most vulnerable neighbors from these kinds of risks. So this, I think Mokley really is a great example of, of um, and, and a, a tremendous opportunity to kind of get to work on all of these issues all at once. Um, some of you probably know it. Uh, Mokley is, it's a 60 acre park today. It's an, you know, it's an existing park right on the waterfront in South Boston. It's right, uh, sits just behind Carson Beach. And, um, Historically, like much of Boston, really historically was mud flats and, and um, salt marshes, and then over time was was filled in to become the park that we we know of today. Um, and it's a critical link in Olmsted's Emerald Necklace. So it was part of the kind of original vision for the Emerald Necklace, along with the Columbia Road um, Parkway. That both of those were kind of the not pieces of the of Olmsted's vision that were not implemented, but they would have connected the necklace all the way out to Castle Island. Um, and it's it's also at the geographic center of Boston, actually. So that it's kind of, you know, we don't think of it as that. It feels kind of way out there, but if you take into account how far northeast he goes and how far south Dorchester goes, Mokley's really in the middle. And that that makes it um, really truly accessible to many of Boston's diverse neighborhoods and kind of a great opportunity to create a park that's both a neighborhood park and a citywide amenity. Um, and despite that, though, the park and the beach really have not always been welcome to everyone. Uh, you know, some images from, you know, a few decades back where black beachgoers were being kept away from just um, 
being, you know, really being present and bathing at Carson Beach with, with, um, you know, white beach goers. So it's really, um, its history is enmeshed with a lot of the systemic uh, racism and his, you know, history of uh, marginalization that has been true throughout Boston. In addition, the immediate neighbors of the park often don't use it. Uh, so um, they're kept away largely by kind of lack of programming that feels inclusive, as well as the challenge of crossing two main roads that separate the park from its immediate surroundings. Um, the immediate surroundings are uh, a number of neighborhoods that are designated as environmental justice neighborhoods for a variety of reasons, um, you know, kind of hitting different markers of um, social vulnerability. Um, and Devonji knows these well. She's been working on, on one of the immediate neighborhood projects for a while. So um, they, uh, so anyway, it's, you know, really important also that the park begins to better serve these immediate neighbors as we think about it, its future. Today, the park is really dominated pretty much by athletics programming, um, you know, active fields from soccer, recreation, or soccer and baseball. But these fields regularly flood. So anytime it rains, there's very high groundwater. So anytime it rains, the fields are flooded and become kind of unusable. In addition to that, the park is one of a series of flood pathways that um, flood huge portions of the city. Um, the immediate neighborhood uh, in, in South Boston, but then also into parts of Roxbury and uh, the South End are impacted. Uh, despite, really despite being threatened by this coastal flooding, the park also feels really far away from this, this um, and really disconnected from the unique culture of the, this urban beach that's just steps away. So the vision for the park really was developed over the last few years and, and actually we just, we're just wrapping up a kind of schematic design for the whole park and are um, looking to move into uh, some construction documentation for a phase one, which is super exciting uh, to see it beginning to move along. But the, the vision for the park really seeks to remedy kind of all these issues that I've, that I've just outlined through enhanced programming and uh, integration of coastal flood protection stormwater management and, and a, a number of other benefits kind of threaded throughout the park that I'll, I'll get into. Um, the vision was informed by a couple of things. The first is a series of um, kind of field studies from our engineers uh, partners at Weston and Sampson that really has given us um, a tremendous amount of knowledge about the, the, com the great complexity of what's below grade here. Uh, there are a lot of large and old utilities and easements um, associated with those utilities. Groundwater, as I mentioned, is extremely high. Um, there are areas with some contamination that will need to be managed and or have already been managed through the field um, process. And then obviously the kind of coastal flooding issues and coastal flooding and all of that is sort of made complicated by the fact that what is below ground is urban fill and it's you know we have areas of bedrock that are 40 feet deep and other areas of bedrock at 250 feet deep and so there's really differential subsidence that we're kind of dealing with as we're looking to elevate the land you know to create this um this flood protection we're also sort of looking at the fact that that land will also be uh you know subsiding as time goes on so that's been um, a kind of back and forth challenge um, in addition to the field field program that we've been doing, we've also been doing a lot of public engagement that's really informed the project. So, you know, reaching out to the community, kind of understanding their goals and, and hopes and dreams, uh, as well, and through a number of different things. You know, this is uh, kind of an event we did in the park where we, we really tried to get people to the park for, to um, respond to surveys and engage with us and then, you know, begin to understand some of the factors that we're employing. So here, this is really about materials and a kind of um, educational program around how stormwater and materials work together. And then um, we had these kind of just fun, a day of, you know, fun in the park where people can do what they want. And we, we had created these um, 
kind of igloos of these inflatable, you know, inner tubes just really to connect the park to the beach. And, and that actually kind of became, unexpectedly became like a day long of kids sort of destroying these things and, and then, you know, spending the day kind of creating new games in the park, which was, um, you know, a really fantastic way to engage. Um, another important part of this was actually to shut down the road that exists currently between Mowgli Park and the beach and is, you know, I, uh, kind of something that's been in discussion as a long term vision. It's not really included as part of the vision of the park, but will be something that we have to consider as the, the water as sea levels rise and start to impact the road, but also as we think about how to better connect the road. So here we had kind of skate demonstrations and like a little parkour event in the in the road and then activities sort of at the beach really trying to enhance this sense of connectivity between the park and the beach and encouraging people to you know come and spend the day and sort of enjoy both the other thing that has been really important is um the a lot of people have been kind of you know i think the public is you know, they see a park today that they want, you know, they would like it to be better maintained or they see issues, you know, just today and they have maybe concerns or doubts that this, you know, the, the city can maintain this park of the future. And so part of what we've been doing is both ensuring that that's built into the way that we're thinking about the design of the park, but also that we've, we've started these monthly cleanups that are really about kind of making a commitment to the management and maintenance of the park over the long term and the community it's been kind of a fun way that for the community to come and get involved and this um importantly this has really been in partnership with boston harbor now and i think that's just i can't emphasize that point enough that really these kinds of parks these kind of parks of the future really the types of partnerships and creative governance that Celine was just talking about are are really important, you know, to to be able to shift the way that things are managed and maintained uh, because they really need to be different kinds of parks. So all of that has really informed um, our the vision for the park and and helped us to set up a series of project goals. Um, overarching kind of all of these goals are, are inclusion and access as a kind of base, um, you, know, uh, you know, kind of baseline goal, it's infused in everything. And then in addition to that are enhancing recreation and play, public, um, public, public health and community well-being, and then incorporating resilience in the environment into everything. And these are really threaded throughout the park. Oh, this is just suddenly taking its own course, hold on. <laughs> Um, sorry, my, I don't know what's happening. These are just, well, we're going to go with three zones. Sorry, I don't, something's um, funny with those slides. They're just running on their own agenda. Um, but <laughs> the, so, you know, all of those ideas are kind of threaded throughout the park and they're expressed in, um, through these kind of three different zones that we've uh, sort of divided the park into these three three zones that with the first being what we're calling the city edge that really connects to the neighborhood and then the core and crest in the in the center of the park which really hosts the coastal protection system and a bunch of athletics programming and playgrounds and then the coastal park which is links the park to the beach each of these zones um takes on one or more of the kind of key aspects of resilience that we want to embed into the park. So the city edge is really all about connecting to the community through this enhanced programming, which includes multiple forms of stormwater, um, porous paving, tree trenches, this, this kind of thing is sort of all embedded really throughout um, the city edge, which is also where the community really comes together and connects with one another and can find new activities. You know, there's community gardens, uh, enhanced basketball courts, and a community center that's really doubling as a resilience hub. So it's got cooling stations and um, you know has the ability to kind of uh, you know have Wi-Fi, uh, vaccination, um, testing, these kinds of things that you know throughout whatever kinds of kind of future emergency, it's really a place for the community to come and, and get whatever services are, are important. That kind of anticipated 
character of that edge really is all about shaded walkways and these kinds of community based activities. Um, you know, there's a running path that kind of moves throughout and um, games for seniors. That kind of thing. Along the core and crest. Um, this, like I mentioned before, really holds all of the athletic programming that sits behind um, what we're calling the core wall, um, which is uh, kind of is the flood protection system. It's really a, there is a wall that's then kind of embedded into the landscape that is um, kind of hosts a number, is sort of this elevated spine that kind of hosts a number of different kinds of programs while also protecting everything that's behind it. Um, so, you know, in, in winter, it can uh, sort of double as um, sledding and other kinds of activity. And then, um, oops, sorry, I, on the, on the um, coastal side of that, we also have uh, kind of an amphitheater and other ways in which the, the wall itself is kind of acting as a, a kind of stimulator of different kinds of programs. In the corn crest, then you know we really have kind of built off of this um, a variety of different kinds of athletics, as well as a kind of an adventure playground with you know slides and a, a really enhanced um, tree canopy that starts to provide sort of a you know a play experience that feels much more like a, a real kind of experience in nature within this the park. The coastal park then is um, really the, like I said, it's really the connection back to the beach. It's kind of, um, it's designed to get wet as sea level rises and as coastal storms move through. Um, it's, you know, the character of it is really trying, to, you know, seeking to kind of bring people back to and connect them to the sense of the beach while also creating place for community. So it's a combination of coastal dunes and coastal landscapes along with things like an amphitheater and a kind of a community barbecue space. And it's all sort of stepping down from that higher point um, of the, that core wall towards the beach. Um, here you can see that amphitheater, it's sort of um, illustrating the way the core wall is, sit is sitting behind it. So that's really doing the kind of, um, you know, FEMA certified work of, of risk reduction while then the landscape is kind of built in and around that. In this case, then, you know, the, the amphitheater would be allowed to flood. Um, then the, you know, this coastal park then also is kind of infused with a variety of different kinds of stormwater management, coastal landscapes, um, really sort of embedding new types of ecological resources into the park, where today the park is really just kind of grass and trees you know, and, and not that many trees <laughs> to begin with. So really trying to sort of enhance the urban canopy and diversify um, the species while also embedding um, stormwater management and kind of coastal marshes into that. The, let's see if this will play. This coastal park is really, the idea is really that it is all about water at different times in different ways. So as storms, you know, rain is falling, storms, the stormwater is captured, but then as we see sea level rise and, and storm surge coming in, you know, the park is allowed to kind of accept that water and then, you know, kind of flows out with the tide. So it's the landscape will, the vision is that for that landscape really to be designed to be adaptive over time to increasing saline conditions. And so we're really, as we move into deeper levels of design, we'll really be thinking about how can we, you know, build this landscape that can be sort of adapted into the future. Uh, so just as a kind of, um, wrapping up you know looking here at the um, the park from the north sort of looking back down on the coastal landscape you can see this a new maintenance um, building that's um, with a kind of maintenance yard in the, the uh, foreground it's really you know about kind of making that commitment to maintenance and management that we i talked about early on that really putting uh you know a parks facility in the park is a uh, of a nod to some of the community's real desire for for this to be really um, you know maintained and to feel safe and welcoming 
Uh, you can see again here then this core wall sort of running the length of the park with then a series of kind of, this is like an overlook and barbecue area on the waterfront side that's elevated. And then behind that, all of the athletics that are protected by both the core wall and these landscapes that are kind of wave reducing uh, landscapes in the, on the waterfront side. So the hope is that it can become really a true community park for the neighbors of South Boston, as well as really citywide um, kind of destination and, and connecting all of the residents of Boston to this incredible amenity of the harbor that we have that, you know, right now the park is really disconnected from. So, um, you know, and that it provides really healthy uh, recreational options and community events for people to enjoy for years to come. Amazing. Um, I have a lot of questions, uh, but uh, any any thoughts, Amy, on um, looking at what Celine presented and thinking about how do you implement this project, or you know, what are the future next steps? Um. I mean, definitely the future next steps. I think. I mean, I think what I, I kind of hinted at this, I think one of the big questions really, you know, interestingly, the <laughs> interestingly, they the I think, you know, the budgets for these parks are much larger than the standard budgets for city parks, right? So while our client is the city of Boston, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting look at like how different clients are sort of having to um you know, manage this, mm -hmm. the, the need to create both um, parks that are expensive to build, you know, it's because of the, the, in our case, it's more about what's below ground that's gonna make it really expensive. It's, you know, the utilities, the issues with the, um, just managing, um, you know, implementing this kind of FEMA certified, you know, hopefully FEMA certified wall, um, and all of that, you know, thinking about how a city really starts to manage that, you know, that's really led us to look at um, and to work with the city on how did they start to prepare and who do they look to, you know, how do they look to get funding for this kind of thing? Um, so kind of interesting, you know, in contrast with this kind of public-private partnership model, you know, and, and I think they start to kind of come together in some ways, you know. Um, I think both of them certainly are going to continue to have these issues of questions of maintenance and management, you know, when they're, for us, it's more when water comes in and out, you know, but having, having a park that's, um, you know, subject to a lot of kind of wild weather, you know, as the, a park out in the Hudson inevitably will be, uh, you know, those I think are really, there's some real parallels there. Um, and then the last thing I would say, you know, for us, I mean, we're, you know, we're just getting into the, we'll just start to begin the construction documentation stage, but it, it, it really will be, I think, a lot of learning about, um, alongside our, the engineers, you know, about how do we work with existing infrastructure to ensure that you know we're tying into these systems and we're continuing to allow for these systems and not not putting pressure on say like underground utilities and these kinds of um, existing networks that are really important you know to the city. Elena, any thoughts on uh, learning about how Boston is uh, designing the parks and how New York? Uh, can parallel or co contradict some of the processes. Uh, you're on mute too. Of course. One thing that your project has is a lot of land. And so I feel that you're able to make many people happy. And yes, while it is all the infrastructure is the most expensive thing. Same with Little Island. It, Yes, the, we turned the structure into an architectural feature, but at the end of the day, it's what is your experience on site and what the 
you know, normal person experiences is the landscape. And that's the least expensive out of all of it. Yet that's really what you want to make sure is perfect. Um, so that's a constant struggle when it comes to where do you spend the money? Because you can't not build the infrastructure. But what you want for your park visitors is the last thing to be built. And then sometimes, depending on your funding source, the money gets reallocated by the time you get to it. And I'm sure there are other landscape architects on the project. And that's my biggest gripe is how do you make sure that there's enough money for the landscape and enough money for the proper construction administration while building these projects to ensure that the vision is sought, like is throughout the entire build of the project. Um, I feel that New York got very lucky with the funding source for Little Island. And I hope that other people have courage to ask people to help contribute. Somebody just literally asked Mr. Diller, hey, will you help us build this park? And at that point, it was just a, a long, narrow Pier 54 redevelopment, you know, elevation six. And they could have just built that without any permitting, anything. But thankfully, Mr. Diller said, our family will help as long as we do something really interesting. And because of that, then we got pushed into a bucket where um, elevation mattered. And for your project, Amy, I'm really excited to see, like, to see that come to life. Um, Boston needs it and the community needs it. And you have, you know, all the ecological opportunities there. It's just incredible. And so I think that'll be a, a precedent for the way of future design along your waterfront. I don't know if there's specific questions. I'm happy to, you know. No, I, I just wanted to, before everyone sort of, uh, I'm still here uh, taking questions, but I, I know, Celine, you have to hop off early. So thank you um, if we lose you at some point. Um, but what an incredible presentation, um, both uh, Amy and Celine. And uh, I hope we, we are able to just continue this conversation and learn from these new projects and just push the, not only the design pieces, but also implementation. Um, I, I am seeing more questions in the chat. Um, I think Sherry had another question about the ownership planning and financing um, of Mokri Park and whether it's considered inner harbor or outer harbor. I think it's inner harbor. You're on uh, yeah, we we're in we are in the Inner Harbor, so we are we're really you know I mean, we're within Boston city limits. Um, and the ownership, um, it is owned by City of Boston Parks Department. So that's you know Parks Department is our client, um, you know, and so that's uh, that is that's kind of part of the you know the crux. I mean, I think. The parks department really has been fantastic in coming out with the, the really requesting that we come up with a vision that is, you know, different than parks that they have already, with the understanding that um, they don't necessarily they're not set up right now to manage that kind of park, but they're going to have to be, you know, and increasingly some of these things are getting built that are you know, have water fluctuations coming in and out and we're learning things. And so, you know, there, I think that's been, um, it's been really great to see a city department say, you know, we, we want to be pushed. And then it's a back and forth of like, how much and how, you know, how far and how do we do this or that? And, and I think, um, you know, there's still, there probably will need to be some kind of, you know, uh, conservancy or friends group or something that emerges through the process to really be to be an advocate for the future of the park you know because we don't have you know in the comparatively you know we don't have the same kind of like uh, public private sort of ownership structure right? right but it's been raising a lot of those questions of how does the city do that especially when we think about the fact that the city has a, you know, many, many miles, 47 miles of shoreline. And a lot of that, if we look at the planning that's going on for, you know, like the climate ready plans, that's, um, you know, this, the recommendation there is that much of that is becoming 
more parkland and parkland that is kind of similarly subject to some flooding. So it's um, it's kind of on the front edge of thinking about some of we're learning, you know, some of those challenges through this process that hopefully will be applicable in other places in the city. Um, at this point, I just want to invite everyone if you want to unmute yourself and it can be a, more of a discussion than a Q&A. Um, and if someone wants has thoughts or questions um, we can just have a discussion around it yeah. i saw also that um uh, bd had a question about parking and um just a, a quick answer there there we have been integrating parking into the into the park itself so the the vision plan has multiple kind of um, parking lots throughout as well as there is some existing street parking uh, today anyway that would remain I had a question uh, regarding uh, flooding seems to drive much of the climate ready Boston flooding and sea level rise. I wondered if other climate stressors such as extreme heat were, were included. You, you mentioned the, uh, the resilience hub aspect of, of part of it. So I wonder if that's part of the thinking as well, since you've got, you, you're storing water on site, which, which can be beneficial. However, if it's seawater, a challenge for many respects and the elevational changes as well. Yeah, yeah, um, it is. Uh, so Boston actually, you know, right now is undergoing kind of its heat, a heat plan. Um, so really looking at, you know, it, issues of extreme heat and that is somewhat, you know, coordinated with the urban forest plan that I'm working on as well. Um, so those are, you know, they are, we're, as to the best of our ability, we're trying to incorporate those into the park. Um, the one of the challenges with the park is that it's already a park. So it's when we try to, you know, we have been running kind of urban heat models on it. And, you know, it's difficult. Uh, we even with adding a lot of canopy, it doesn't change the kind of overall heat, you know, the modeling that much. But what we have been thinking about more in the park is how, I mean, of course, what our material choices are and how to keep, you know, how to lower that as best we can, but also how um, we might uh, embed, you know, kind of embed within the park pathways that are cooler, you know, so it co more cooler experiences. So while the overall experience of the park may be equivalent, um, or slightly lower, you know, there's more spaces for that kind of like being able to walk, take a walk through the park fully in shade or, and a series of kind of like cooling stations and places that specifically respond to really high heat days. Uh, so it could become a place where someone could come and get some relief um, that's better than what is there now, you know, even though it's, it's you know, today it's better than, you know, the, the, um, some of the relatively dense, you know, areas nearby that don't have a lot of vegetation. And then the canopy, canopy wise, uh, we are dramatically increasing the canopy as you know, with the, the vision right now does really increases the canopy, which is, you know, helpful uh, in terms of that, but also that's playing into the urban forest plan on the whole. So it's, it really, you know, we really are, it was driven by water and driven by coastal flooding as the issue that was kind of the you know the the like accelerant you know but um it it really because it's such a large property it, you know it really has the opportunity to kind of address all of the different factors of resilience that the city's facing Um, Zachary had a question on whether it's a public-private project. If so, who sees the PPP? Uh, no, it's not. It's um, fully, yeah. fully public. Yeah. And Cherry had a question about what is the estimated total cost of Mokley Park? What does that average out on per acre? Um, I'm going to have to do math, but it uh, the so the current 
estimate for the whole park. I, I was I thought this was interesting. Actually, the current estimate for the park is 250 million. So it's pretty much exactly the same cost as Little Island. But it was so uh, small. Yeah, obviously the cost per acre is significantly <laughs> lower uh, than Little Island. And that's, you know, I, I should, I think there's a, a, a caveat with that is obviously that's a Little Island is a constructed cost where we're at a conceptual early, you know, kind of conceptual schematic level cost. So, um, you know, as, as it goes along, I'm sure that will change and that will change to also depending on when it actually is built, you know, we're sort of, it will be phased over time. I have a question about uh, permitting. What do you what do you anticipate as being the biggest challenges with permitting? Hmm. And that's for both, but I suppose uh, I suppose we lost the little uh, little island. I can't remember if she touched on permitting issues. Yeah. I'm sure that their permitting was, well, different, but probably more complicated, you know, than, <laughs> I mean, it, as, as I see you're from Limnotech, which, hi, we, we love you guys, uh, we're big fans, um, but. Uh, um, Feelings mutual. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, as you know, anything, anytime you're getting into the water, the permitting gets complex, right? Um, Mowgli, the, the challenge, really, I think the biggest challenge with Mowgli has to do with how we, um, how it is, it, because it's probably, it's, you know, as of right now, I mean, unless somebody comes along and says, we would like to build this, you know, if we, if we get a Barry Diller kind of type, you know, who says, let's just build it, um, it will be phased. And that means the, the core wall would have to be phased. And so, you know, it, like that gets into kind of complexity around, are we permitting a full 60 acre park, which was, I think someone else had the question about how many acres it is, you know, are we permitting the whole park all at once? Or are we permitting in phases? And how can we permit a seawall that's built in segments? You know, so that there's been a lot of, um, and again, you know, we're still at kind of early stages in what that approach would be. But yeah, and the key question there is also, what if the standard and the modeling and the projections change within yeah. one part transi transitioning into other one. Yeah, exactly. So that, you know, that's, that's, um, that'll be it. that we're, you know, we've, we've had some initial conversations with a number of the different permitting agencies, um, you know, in Boston, mostly kind of Boston local permitting agencies to understand, you know, from at the local level, what would we have to go through? It is, you know, it's on, um, it does trigger a number of different kinds of uh, permits, um, and in part, in part, mostly due to its size. You know, because it is so large, that kind of triggers a number of things that we we need to go through. Right now, none of that seems too onerous. You know, I mean, it doesn't seem like the kinds of right. You know, it's regulatory stuff we just need to go through. It's not. Um, there aren't issues so far. We haven't encountered an issue that's like, okay, we have to, you know, we we really have to um, get creative about how we go about that. As you might, you know, if you're out in the water, um, it's more except for the except for the case of phasing the wall, which maybe we'll see how that what happens there. I had another one too, not to, I don't hear people chiming in or, or yeah. putting things in the chat. If, if you do have questions, please add to it, folks. Um, but uh, I was curious whether COVID gave this project a boost. You know, we've we've seen, I think, a, an increased interest in actual use of public spaces, open spaces over the last almost two years now. 
Um, so there's been the, the, the downside that it's harder to be out in, in public, but um, these types of spaces, I, I just wondered if, if there was even more support that was built for this where, where people didn't take open space for granted as they might have a couple of years ago. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, but I would say I haven't, I haven't seen it. Um, I haven't, and I think the, the positive side of that answer is that there was a lot of enthusiasm and support before. Um, I think, you know, especially within the city, it had been, uh, because it's really uh, part of this larger flood, this larger series of flood pathways. And it's um, because the, it's really kind of, uh, you know, an, an early, kind of, a, a, you know, an early player in the climate ready, like actually sort of getting ready to implement on the climate ready side. Um, it, there was a lot of support, you know, from the mayor down. And so it, I would say it did, that didn't change, you know, necessarily. It's, it, we still have that support. It has kind of shifted, I think, like the coastal flooding side, while it's still really important, it's not the main story, you know, for a while, I feel like that was kind of like the way the park was really talked about. And, and while it's still is a really important part. I think there's more and more there's increasing interest in the other aspects of what the park can do. So more interest in the social side, <coughs> excuse me, and some of the you know issues of heat and canopy and some of the other kind of factors. So it's you know it's shifted, but it hasn't necessarily been you know I don't know I haven't seen like a big benefit or demand or, you know demand or greater interest as a result of COVID. Um, hey, Pritchard is asking, were there any design considerations, constraints you were get, expecting that has impacted the design, endangered, endangered species, or working within the tide lands? Um, I would say the biggest one really was, um, has been um, what's underground. That's been a, a huge uh, you know, lots of surprises. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say necessarily surprises. We know that Boston is on filled land. And so it wasn't surprising that this, the ground below is, you know, diverse. <laughs> that is, you know, there's a lot of different conditions, but the degree to which, um, you know, that how we work with that and how we have to work with, um, these really differing conditions uh, and existing utilities, I think that's really started to drive, you know, we had the vision actually went through a, a pretty big shift from a kind of, we had like a vision planning um, project start that started in 2017, that, you know, we created a vision for that. And then after that vision, we brought on the engineers to do um, kind of a, you know, the vision was a little bit more like a master plan perhaps. And then we sort of got into like conceptual design that was a you know pretty deep dive conceptual design. That's when we brought the engineers on. And so the, the park the design really shifted as a result of those engineering field tests and some of the input that we got through that, you know, where we could put the berm had to move um, and it just how kind of how we could how we might have to manage that. And, um, you know, there's places where we need to use a lot of lightweight soils and other kinds of um, more kind of engineered solutions in order to deal with those conditions. So that's been the more um, unexpected side, I think, is, is that, you know, the surface today, there really aren't, there isn't really a lot of endangered species or anything because it's, it is pretty much grass and a few, species of trees. The one really interesting one, there's sort of a collection of uh, combined apple crab apple trees at the southern end of the site that are sort of fascinating that we're, you know, we're interested in, in preserving, but they're, uh, you know, they don't have any regulations around them. So, so um, not, not too tricky. Um, someone had a question about time frame. 
It, it's a great question. I mean, we it, so much of that will depend on funding. We've assumed that it's at least probably you know a ten year project. Um, it may be longer than that. Uh, you know, depending on kind of how how it's able to be funded through implementation. Okay. I think if that is all, um, I want to thank Amy again uh, for such a informative and visionary design presentation. Um, so if anyone's interested in participating or if you have an idea that you would like uh, to be discussed, feel free to reach out to me or Dave. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we try to organize about you know, six to eight events a year. Um, and recently we've been working on this series called Climate Connections. Um, it's, this is the second one uh, in that series. We had one that was co-hosted by Coat, and we talked about um, the MIT Nano project and how they're um, sort of contributing towards, uh, you know, carbon neutral neutrality and uh, discussions around energy. Um, and then we are focused more on the ecological and the public realm side. So. Uh, if you want to be more involved in uh, helping organize these conversations, or if you have an idea, if you have a potential speaker, feel free to reach out to me. Our emails are on the website. Um, you can also just type it in here. Um, and then I also, I also, if you are looking for AIA credits, I sent a, sent a Google form in the chat. Um, just feel free to fill it out and um, Susan Green from BSA who will uh, make sure you get your credits for AIA. Any other last thoughts from anyone? I can talk. <laughs> so yeah. um, I am at UMass Amherst right now under the um, Bachelor's of Architecture and um, I was just like asking, I wanted to ask more about how the park has um, sort of contributed the community and the design process. And like, how could that, how, like have, have they used a specific technique that um, can make the community feel more involved? Um, that's something that the class that I'm in, most of my classes are, really concerned about. So yeah, I wanted to ask Amy about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. It definitely has been, we've had um, a lot of different techniques, I would say, um, in part because of COVID, you know, that really had to change you know, what we were doing. Um, we, and we've been working now, you know, for a few years at it. So we've kind of try different things and as we go we sort of evaluate you know how successful have they been um you know we started out with kind of open houses in the neighborhood so um we had a couple different open houses at at a you know local um you know places that are right in the neighborhood right next to the park um we used we tend to do a lot of engagement that involves games and ways that people can kind of, you know, they can come and go on their own time and give us input in their own way and, you know, respond to questions, um, try to make it fun. Um, so we had a number of those. Uh, we also, through those, also did a kind of interview process where we would just interview people and have longer conversations with them if they were interested. Um, and then we had this, the on-site event that I mentioned, you know, so that was really about getting people out into the park and helping them imagine kind of new, you know, new ways of being in the park that you might be able to go there to do something other than play sports. Um, that, you know, we, so we, that continued and we kind of had a plan for, for, you know, 2019, 2020, and then obviously that was all shifted and everything went to being online. Um, so we have done a series of workshops and online events that you know we've tried to keep 
that momentum. And it was kind of during that where we, we've also started to partner with Boston Harbor now. So they now are, so this kind of, kind of address some of the questions about, is it public private? It is um, public, but then we have this nonprofit group that because they're really invested in the Harbor, they're really invested in this park. Um, and so, you know, they've been helping with some of the community engagement as well. So they've started to have some events out in the park. We partnered with them to start the cleanup that I mentioned um, that really, you know, is that has been about what can we do today? You know, this park is going to, it's not going to be built for a while and it has issues today. You know, there are people find needles there. People, it, you know, storms hit and there's branches that are down. Like there's stuff that needs to happen and there, you know, the city maintenance departments are always, um, you know, they're often understaffed and underfunded and challenged. And so, you know, a park as big as Mokley, you know, they can use all the help they can get. And so that's been a great way to kind of get out there and make a commitment to changing something today that is an issue for people right now, you know, whereas climate change is an issue for people in depending on which issue, but the coastal flooding is an issue 30 years from now. And so it's kind of hard for people to get their head around it as something that, you know, they need, there's all this change happening to the park because of something that's way out there. So I think, you know, that's been a, uh, so far it's been really well attended and, you know, people have been, um, lots of people from the community have been coming and, and we always, every time we're out there, we get a lot of people just thanking us, you know, for coming in and cleaning up the parks. So I think that, you know, we keep looking for opportunities like that to, to be engaged. Um, and then we've recently also hired a consultant um, to help. One of the things we found is that it has been harder to get certain neighborhoods to that could be really benefiting from the park and using it, but don't necessarily come to those um, uh, events and more youth, you know, because it's a park that's, it's a park for the future, you know, so we really want those groups who, you know, probably have a, have a longer term stake in the park to be part of that engagement process. So we've been developing ideas around, you know, as we move forward, how can we ensure that we're better, um, we're communicating better with those groups of people. So, I, I mean, it's an, it is an ongoing iterative process, you know, of try stuff, evaluate it, see how successful it was. Did people really come? Did we get the feedback we needed? And then, you know, shift our approach to try to better achieve, um, you know, more, more input from more diverse people and people who continue to come back and start to take part, really feel like they are a part of the project, you know, or part of the process along the way. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that, that was great. Um, it feels like something that most people don't really cover, but it's very important for the youth to be, to be part of the design process. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, thanks for Bye. having me.